It's great to be here with my friend John Daly for a, a little podcast interview. Hi, John. How are you? Donald, how are you doing? You okay? Ah, you're surviving this lockdown now. Oh, yeah, I'm coping. I'm coping, yeah. I'm probably at the stage just uh, about to kill the kids and then the missus. So I, I, need to, I need to get out and about now. So now it's, it's been... It's been enjoyable. I've actually enjoyed the time with the family and, and being able to spend that with them. So it's been great. It, it, I think, I don't know what you're like, and you're probably the, been the same, you're traveling and working a lot. You, you only, it's only when you're at home you realize how far, how much time you spend out of the house, isn't it? When yeah, you... it's, it is. It's incredible. Like, you know, I think obviously since I've left Hearts, I've obviously been in and around the house a bit more. And it's, it has been a strange period because prior to that, I'd been kind of working for 22 yeah. years in the game and it's this yeah. is the kind of first extended period out of the game that I've had um, so it has been a, a bit strange and a, and a bit weird and then obviously then you add the lockdown to that as well so um, so yeah no, as I said it's been great to be able to actually just enjoy the family time and um, but now I feel like I'm, I'm ready to get back out and about and get back going again you know sure. we were speaking earlier and I, and I know you've been keeping yourself busy you know I've, I've seen you quite a lot over the last year or so on the pro license as well mm -hmm. and you've been doing some webinars and podcasts over the lockdown as well yeah I, I think that's that's one of the things that I think has been really positive with this whole lockdown it's you know being able to speak to different people and, and to network with different people and um, and just you know, reach. Like I spoke to you earlier about having doing a webinar with like, coaches in India, and and then I've you know I've done uh, Gary Kurnin, who's um, mm, yeah. out in America. Um, mm. Done one with him. I've done quite a few. You know, and when people normally ask me to do them, I'm quite happy to come on and talk to, to new people and meet new people, and um, you know, and it, and it keeps you busy as well, I suppose. That's true. And as, uh, you know, football always made the world small, but it seems even smaller now, isn't it? You were saying speaking to the coaches in India and Australia and America, it's just incredible. How did you, uh, well, come back to your coaching kind of career a, a bit later, John, but how did you get into football as a kid? Did you always love football? Yeah, I think I think it kind of came from, from my dad and my brother. Um, you know, my dad coached my brother's football team, um, the local team when I was I'm trying to remember how, how young I was, but I've seen uh, pictures of me just joining in the training sessions. And, you know, if, if they were doing shooting exercises or, or, or anything like that, I would just join the back of the queue yeah. and grab a ball. And, and, and I kind of just picked it up from that. And, and then as I got older, you know, it was just a passion. Just, I remember coming home from school and first thing you do is try to bag in the door, grab the football and you were away out with your, either your friends or yourself, just yeah. playing the ball off the wall. the, the area that I lived in was really good because the house was right on the, the end of the street. So, yeah. and, and at the end of that was, was a, there was a, a big green, a big field area. So my brother and myself, we, we used to build goals out of wood and we used to just put the plank them down. And we had, we had great crack as kids just going out and playing. Um, and that's there. My mem memory memories of a kid are just with the football out on the, on the field or out on the street, playing it off the wall and just working on your touch. And it's always something that, you know, I remember even being in school and, and the teachers asking me, you know, what are you going to do when you leave school? And, and I, I used to just say football player because I thought it was that easy just to, yeah. you know, be a foot. And, and they used to just be like, well, what if you aren't? And I was no adamant. I was adamant that that's yeah. what I was going to do. And, um, and fortunately enough, then I obviously got the opportunity. But yeah, my, growing up, I just remember joining them with my dad and, and my brother and um, and, and obviously watching Man United, you know, because yeah. my brother was a massive Man United fan, so he he drilled that into me from a young yeah. age. Um, so yeah, so that that was kind of my earliest memories. And was your brother older than you? Yeah, my brother was older. So uh, um, older brother, um, he just turned forty the other day. Yeah. So incredible how oh, yeah. how quick it all goes, doesn't it? And what position did your brother play? The, the reason, because I noticed that quite a lot with with people as well, is is. You know, when you especially have a, an older brother, you're always striving to to you know challenge them or be good, as good as them, or or you're always going to around with them. Did did you play you know uh, with your brother's teams as well? Did you play with your brother's mates? You play a bit older than you. Um, well, what we kind of did was we had like where we lived. As I said, there was there was a big kind of field area in between all the estates, mm. so we used to have. Yeah you know, teams from different estates that would play yeah. each other. Like I, I was, again, really, really lucky growing up that there was, 
there was a lot of kids around our yeah. age and there was a lot of good players in the area. You know, there was a, the Quinn brothers that, um, you know, they all went across yeah. England to play. And um, I'm trying to think Mark Beardshaw, who went, went mm-hmm. to, to Nottingham Forest. We had Robbie McGuinness that was in mm-hmm. our team who, who went and played for Blackburn and, mm-hmm. um, and then obviously played a lot in League of Ireland. So there was, there was a lot of good quality players mm-hmm. in the area. And we used to have different, like, different estates and we used to have yeah. games against each other and yeah. um, so the, the, the age is kind of varied you'd be playing against kids that were maybe four or five years older and then maybe yeah. some that were maybe a year or two younger like the, if you could kick a ball and, and yeah. you could run about you were in the team yeah so, um, yeah. so no it was great we, we, we had some some fantastic uh, games on that field and um, I always remember it was it was funny I remember uh, Willow Flood lived kind of yeah. it would have been 20 minutes away maybe 15 minutes away but I remember we were playing a match against the team across and we had to stop because there was these horses coming towards us and it was Willow and his mates on his horse was <laughs> straight, it? straight through but the oh, yeah. ditch yeah, yeah. so uh, so now some, some fantastic memories as a kid um, as I said playing uh, the games on the, on the I street. love I love those stories Joel because it's the same when I was growing up you know you're always playing with your mates and you know, especially on a Sunday, it was all afternoon. You know, you would play as long as you as long yeah. as you could play, and then you get shouted in for your tea, or you'd have to go in for your your tea. How important do you think that kind of street football and playing with your mates? How important do you think that is for a footballer in terms of your development? Yeah, I, I do. I do think it is massive, and I, I think it's something that probably has, you know. Probably, you know, when I look out on my own street here, you don't see it see that often. Now, obviously, I don't have a big field next to my house where I am just oh. now, and I think that obviously helps. Um, but even we used to play on the street, you know, mm. playing off the poles and the lampposts and the trees, and mm. um, and I do I do think it is great. I think it just it's just touches of the football, and it's just yeah. you know yeah. getting you know constant contact with the ball. And mm. um, as I said, I just remember you know very often just bag straight in. Yeah. under the stairs grab the ball and I was out and, and you're talking about like hours and hours and hours yeah. of like practice and, and yeah. hours of just you know right foot left foot yeah. you know heading the ball you know so there was there was loads of you know practice that was just done and yeah. and I think for me that you know that alone will just help improve you just yeah. by that constant contact I, th- I think it, I agree totally and I think you know you see in science the 10,000 hour rule you know for mastery mm-hmm. or so, so of that and so many of those hours I think are done before you're eight and nine especially in those circumstances yeah. where you're out with your mates and it's not like you're counting are you you're just no, doing something you love but it's funny because I've, I've actually just started uh, I'm probably about four or five chapters into the talent code and, and you're ah. reading about you know the the repetition and, and yeah. the moiling and and yeah. you know um, firing up the you know the circuits for for certain yeah. um, movements and stuff and um, you know because it is down to down to practice and it is yeah. down to going out and, and practicing the certain movements and certain um, you know you look at look at David Beckham for instance I you know, know specialist free kick taker it doesn't just happen it's because yeah. he spent hours upon hours out on the tr- training pitch as a kid as a, an adult practicing how to hit that free kick and yeah. and I do think it is really important yeah. it, it's incredible I remember seeing and you'll you'll relate to this I remember seeing um, a documentary on Maradona and he was speaking about playing on the street and but also just a, he would deliberately go out at dusk because he wouldn't see the ball as well you know, right, okay, and, and yeah, yeah. it's just incredible. You know, when it's late, when you're playing with your mates, it's late, the, the, the sun's, you know, going down. And, and you never think about that, but I thought it was a great point. That's all the, the bits that, you know, are yeah. invisible to people, aren't they? You know, yeah, well, I think you know, that's, you know, with that mindset, you can see why Maradona's gone on to yeah. be one of the best players in the world, if yeah. not the best. Um, yeah. You know, to go to go out to actually think of stuff like that, to go out and practice yeah. in the dusk when you can't see the ball is 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 brilliant. Um, yeah. we obviously used to play when it was quite dark. Yeah. But I yeah. never, I never thought of it like that. Maybe no. that's why I never got to that same level as Maradona. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I was the same, John, and and remember because that's when I was watching it and I thought, God, you know, that you would do it naturally, but he was doing it on purpose. Yeah, you know, as you said, he was going. I'm going to go out there and yeah. I can't brilliant. see it right, and it's just incredible as well. And I must oh. Hopefully I'll speak to Willow later on in this week or so. So I'll have to get yeah, you'll have to get on with Willow about his horse. <laughs> you know, I, I, I honestly used to crack me up you know, when you see Willow coming along with a little bit of rope in its mouth, and he'd be uh, 
He was so oh, mad yeah. with love with the other oh, horse. Yeah. And how did you get into the professional game then, John, from there? What was your what was your route? So at the age of, I think it was seven, I played for the local side. Um, yeah. The, uh, with the estate that we kind of lived mm. in started up a football team because as I said there was a lot of um, a lot of interest in it and, yeah. and then I, I, I think the the youngest age group was under 10 so I was only mm. 7 so I was uh, given a lot of years mm. to it um, and then my dad where my dad is from um, in Dublin is where Cherry Orchard are right. originally from so mm. that's one of the big football clubs mm. in Dublin so he, he brought me down the, the year after to, mm. to do trials for Cherry Orchard and yeah. um, and I managed to get into the squad and then I was there yeah. for years. And it, it's, it gives you a platform when you're playing for one of the biggest clubs in Dublin. Mm. It gives you a platform yeah. to, to then get opportunities. Um, so I went on numerous trials to different clubs in the UK. Yeah. Um, and I, I went to Stockport. Uh, mm. I chose to sign for Stockport mm -hmm. um, because I, I just felt at that time, the players I spoke with earlier, a lot of them had kind of went, that ones that were older had went to the UK to play. Yeah. Um, and had found themselves maybe a year or two coming back. They they never kind quite made it. So mm. it, that kind of stuck with me, and I kind of I wanted to, I wanted to have a prolonged career, and I wanted to get opportunities to play in the first team. So that's why I kind of went to Stockport because I just felt mm. um, that they hadn't got the resources to go out and spend millions of pounds on a striker, mm -hmm. or you know if they needed someone, they would have to look within their own system. Mm. Um, and again. You know, a lot of it comes down to right place, right time. Mm. Um, you know, strikers weren't playing well, um, injuries, suspensions, and then, as I said, they haven't got the money to go out and replace them. So, so I got an opportunity, and and thankfully, I, I managed to uh, to take that. Brilliant. And what coaches? Who influenced you during these these years as a coaches? Who who shaped your game or or give you put you on the right track? So I think originally my dad, 100% yeah. um, at the start, you know, he he was a very talented footballer, but never mm. never went on to play at any level. But, you know, mm. from, from speaking to his friends and, you know, he was he was a top, top player, but mm. probably hadn't got the right um, focus at that time yeah. or maybe hadn't yeah. got the right opportunities at that time yeah. to, to go on. Um, so he 100% he was yeah. the one at the start that, that guided me on. Um, and then, when, as I said, when I went to Stockport, you know, Craig Madden, for me, yeah. um, was the youth team coach, but he was, he was a striker in his day. Yeah. So he understood the role. He understood mm. how, how strikers should play and what they yeah. should do, the movements they should be looking yeah. for. And, and he kind of helped guide me, mm. um, I suppose, in, into trying to find what, what yeah. best suited me. Because I think as a kid, you know, you're still probably a bit unsure about what, like, I... When I was a kid, I used to run channels, and then when yeah. I went, to, I stopped doing it because I was kind of pigeonholed as, you know, you're you're over six foot, you're a, a big yeah. boy, you can you can be this type of striker, and I, I think yeah. you know Craig was probably the first one that, um, you know, guided me on that path, and um, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time there and, and, and playing for Stockport, and yeah. and as I said, working with someone like Craig was was great for me at that age. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how did from Stockport? I remember certainly, you know, I remember you at Dundee United. What was you? Did you go from Stockport to Dundee United? No, I went Stockport to Hartlepool. Um, Hartlepool. Neil Cooper was the manager yeah. there. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, we had Neil Cooper and Martin Scott were the were the coaches, yeah. and um, and they were great. Again, going yeah. into a, a good team at Hartlepool that um, were always kind of challenging at the right yeah. end of the table and. You know, again, two, I had two years there before yeah. I went to Dundee United. And then Dundee United is probably where, you know, I probably had my most prolific, my most, mm. um, you know, probably most enjoyable time as yeah. a player in terms of the successes that I had. But yeah. also in probably the most, you know, downtime as well because, yeah. you know, I had the injuries that I had there yeah. as well. So yeah. it was a lot of highs and lows at Dundee United, but probably... I would imagine, yeah, looking back, that's the club that I probably feel most connected to. Yeah. Um, and what was it about your time at, the, at Dundee United then, John, that thing, whether it, was it the timing of you going there at that stage of your career, or was it how they played football, or was it a bit of everything coming together? I, I think, yeah, 100%, a bit of everything coming together. I think it was the timing. I think I was just mm -hmm. torn maybe... I'm trying to think of the years now, I was maybe just turned 24, mm. 23, 24. So at an, at, I felt at a good age to mm. to really focus and, and, and knuckle down and, and, and try and 
you know, push on in my career. Yeah. Um, and I think the club at the time had a really good bunch and a really good yeah. group of players. Um, like obviously Craig Levine, mm. the manager, was was really really mm. good. Um, and the staff, Peter Houston, Tony mm. Docherty, yeah. Gary Cork, all really really good staff that were were there to help and mm. to try and make you better and mm. try and improve you as a player. Yeah. And everything was there to to try and you know help um, yeah. and to try and help improve. And yeah, so I think I think. The injuries, I think, helped as well, mm. believe it or not, because, yeah. you know, I think I was very much of the mindset, you know, once once you get over that initial disappointment of being injured and yeah. being out and not being able to play, I kind of used that time to focus on how I can improve and what can I learn, mm. how can I get better. Um, and, and I think I understood my role a bit more in them yeah. times because, you know, sitting in the stand watching games, mm. I think you see a different, different mm. game, you see a different picture mm. than when you're on the pitch. So I think that helped improve me and helped make me a better time, uh, sorry, a better player for when I came back. And did you consciously do that when you sat, um, sat in the stand watching the game? Did you think, oh, what am I going to learn here? Or did you find that just almost happened because, you know, you were there? Or Because you always seem pretty focused to me in terms of, I've seen you as, in a, as a coach as well, as getting the most out of yourself. Have you always been like that? Yeah, I think for me, like even when I when I initially when I played at United, like mm. I had a great relationship with the likes of Craig Conway, yeah. um, uh, Sean Dillon, and yeah. and boy, like I was very much a player that relied on my teammates and relied mm. on service. So, you know, I looked at it along the lines of like what like Craig Conway, for instance. I always knew that when he went down the outside in his left foot, mm. the ball was always coming in the middle to front. It was never mm. going to the back post. So I always had to try and make that movement into that yeah. area. When he cut back in his right foot, I always knew he was going to whip it into that back mm. area. So, it, you know, it was getting a relationship and, and asking the players, you know, and, and speaking to them about what they're trying to do, the areas they're trying mm-hmm. to hit, um, to try and help both of us. Because if they get assists and I get goals, mm. it helps both of us and it helps the team. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, when I was in the stand, like, I, I, I did, I used to watch my position because... Mm balls coming up to the striker, I would maybe look and I'd be thinking, well, I maybe would have flicked that on there or mm. I would have tried to do this. And then you would see the space that you would have had um, mm. that you probably at the time, I think when you're playing, you know, you maybe have a little scan and a look, mm. but then the picture changes so quickly. Yeah. And you feel it so quickly when you're on yeah. the pitch, but when you're sitting in the stand watching it, you actually have realise you have more time yeah. than than you probably yeah. realise and, and um, than you perceive to have on, yeah. on the pitch. So, um, so yeah, I, I used to look at it and think, right, well, I, I would have done that, and but these are the other options that I maybe could have mm. done, and um, and I do, I think that helped them when I came back because I, I probably um, use that information that you kind of collect, yeah. um, and you try and then implement it when you when you come back and you're back on the pitch. How important do you think it is, like what you're saying there, John? I, I think this is just so important for a player, but how? important do you think it is for a player in a position, say that's a, a great example, centre forward, because it so, almost seems so distinct, to have an understanding of different positions on the park. Do you think that's quite crucial now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I think I, I found that when I went and played centre-back. Yeah. Um, like I played maybe half a dozen games at centre-back for Dundee United and, and I really enjoyed it and I, and I, um, I found it quite comfortable because... Yeah. I kind of knew the mindset of the striker and I knew what the yeah. strikers were looking to do. You know, they're bring, they want me to come short yeah. to spin in behind me or maybe looking to run behind, run there to come eat opposite movements. And yeah. so you, 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 because I had an understanding mm. of how strikers played, I kind of found playing at centre-back mm. quite comfortable. Um, but I do, I think it, it is important that, you know, if, if I personally prefer to attack mm. the ball in the back area, but the winger likes to put the ball in the front area, that's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to work. Yeah. So I think it's trying to find that compromise and it's trying yeah. to, you know, it's trying to, like, you know, Conway, for instance, as I, I'll use him as an example mm. again, like, when he came cut back in his right foot, I knew nine times out of ten the mm. area he was trying to, it didn't yeah. always go there. Yeah. It didn't always go there, but I always knew that, right, I need, I need to leave that space free until the last mm. minute to give myself the best chance. Mm. Um, and if, you know, he would probably hit it seven, eight times out of ten. Um, mm. But I would, I would have to attack that space at the right time. And I think, you know, having that understanding of what your teammates like to do and what they want to do, 
I think it's it's it is really important yeah. because as you say, it's split second, isn't it? You know, the more you've thought of it about it before you go go on, it gives your unconscious mind that split second, isn't it? To make that run just at the right moment, so you're not overthinking on the park. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And I think I think yeah. when you have that understanding with your teammates, I think yeah. you know it's very easy for people to see that you have that understanding then as well, yeah. because um, because it's clear on the pitch that yeah. you you, you know um, what each other are trying to do. Yeah. And I think the more teammates you can understand what they're trying to do, yeah. like like we spoke about Willow, yeah. I knew when when the ball came to Willow. I knew that he wanted to play around the corner into the feet. Yeah. So there was no point in me trying to pull off the centre back or or make movements in behind because yeah. I knew that he wanted to play around the corner and get a bounce and, and get a wall pass that yeah. he could come and play. And yeah. um, you know, so it, it, it's it's understanding what your teammates are trying to do and, and then aligning your game um around that, I suppose. See, when we're speaking, John, just about this part of, you know, in, in your career and playing, you can see how you were suited as well to be a coach because you're a thoughtful, deep thinker about the game, I think, when you were playing. Did you always have an interest in coaching? Um, I, I probably when I, not when I first started. You know, mm. I don't really think you maybe think about that. It's probably yeah. as you get into that latter stages of your career and, um, and you start to think, right, what? I'm coming, yeah, have that realisation of yeah. I'm coming towards the end of my playing days. What am yeah. I going to do um, when I finish? And I think, yeah, I think myself, Will O'Shawn, we, we all done the B licence in 2011. Yeah. And that was probably the first um, the first time that I, I maybe mm. properly thought about it and, and looked into it. And um, and I think doing that while I played was, was probably the best thing for me because... Yeah. It gave it gave me a great appreciation of what the coaches mm-hmm. and the managers do, and mm-hmm. um, and how difficult the job is. Um, yeah. You know, because I think as a player, you used to just turn up the training, you'd look out on the pitch, what what are we doing today, and and mm-hmm. you, you don't realise the thought process that has gone into that yeah. session and, and the reasoning behind that session. You just think, oh, we're doing a possession today, and and you probably don't think about why you're doing that possession. But I think after yeah. doing the the introduction in the B license you then maybe start asking more questions and, and mm. maybe ask them why we're doing something and, and you know, what's, what, what you're looking for out of this yeah. possession or, you know, and I think, yeah. I think that stage was probably when I started, you know, to, mm. to really think about it. And how did you make the transition into coaching then from a player? Yeah. So I, I kind of went into it probably before I had planned to, um, yeah. you know, it was, I, I, Sign for when I left Rangers, yeah. my plan and, and my 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 kind of vision was to go mm. and play abroad for a couple of yeah. seasons, go and experience yeah. something different. And um, so I, I left Rangers and I, I mm. kind of looked at a few different mm. options and, and I went, actually went out to South Africa and mm-hmm. um, trained with a team out there for a week yeah. um, and it never really happened. So I came back and mm. I spoke to Ray McKinnon about going to Rate mm. for mm. you know five months just to, yeah. to sign till the January um, with the view to then trying yeah. to go abroad again in January. But during that period in October, I got a phone call of, of Craig uh, mm-hmm. Levine. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was speaking to me about the doing the 20s development role of Hearts. Yeah. And, you know, I spoke to my wife and it just felt like a great opportunity at the yeah. time. Um, you know, I think we spoke about it earlier. Yeah. The opportunities in Scotland are quite limited. Yeah. You know, full-time roles are quite limited. So it, it was a fantastic opportunity to to make that transition, um, and and to, to probably stop playing on my own terms as well. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes that can be quite difficult for players when they do finish. You know, mm. if it's whether they, you know, they're waiting. You know, whether yeah. it's a period like now where they're waiting yeah. to see if they're getting a contract or not, and then nothing happens, and then they end up falling out of the game. Or I just felt it, it just felt like the right time, and. Yeah. Um, and I, so I met with Anne and, and Robbie and yeah. Craig and had, we had yeah. a chat about it all and um, I liked what they were talking about I liked the plans they had in place and, yeah. and they obviously liked um, what I had to say as well so um, so yeah it was it was, it was a, again really fortunate uh, right yeah. place right time yeah. um, and to go in and work with a group that were mm. you know a really talented group and, mm. and, and really focused on, on improving mm. and it was great for me to, to help my accelerated development as a yeah. coach as well. Yeah. And was there anything that surprised you about going into the coaching? You know, was there anything that you thought, oh, I'll, I thought this would be easy, 
and this was difficult or the opposite I thought this would be really difficult and actually it was I came like you know really easy for me was there any um I I found it probably the pla- I think when you probably haven't taken a team and you haven't mm. done I think the hardest part for me was when like you know I like to be organized I like to be prepared yeah. and you know when when I've planned the session or I've I've, yeah. I've gone out and I've I've looked at the numbers that I've got and I've maybe got yeah. four centre backs and going right I'm going to work yeah. on my centre backs today yeah. I'm going to help try and improve them today yeah. and then and then Stevie Crawford would come in and five minutes before the session say oh sorry John uh, Robbie needs you know three players and it's the three three of the four centre backs <laughs> that it's wanting to work on <laughs> so so having to then adapt quickly and and quickly change the session yeah. because because players aren't daft they know no. they know when yeah. you're flapping and yeah. and I think. Um, you know, it's having to have that calmness and having that, um, you know, that that adaptability to be yeah. able to just quickly change the session. Um, initially, at the start, I found really tough, but yeah. uh, as it as it went on, you, you you kind of prepare for every eventuality, and oh, and you're 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 prepared, and you you can be as prepared as much as you can, and and you you adapt really quickly to change the session to to suit the players that you have left. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I think that that yeah. development role, I think for me, is is very much about the players. It's very much about um, trying to work on. Because you're limited with your numbers, um, you know. So you don't get to work on a lot of tactical elements on how yeah. you want your team to play. So it's more about yeah. individual development, the players, and and trying to improve them. And what aspects of coaching do you get the most out of, John? What what is the areas you think? Oh, that's that's the the area that I really love just working on and doing. Um, I, I love the planning side of it. You know, planning yeah. the sessions and planning. Um, you know, I used to love that with myself and Foxy. Mm. Used to sit down yeah. and we used to plan the sessions and and you'd go over what you wanted to do and what you were reasons why you were doing them. Yeah. Um, and then and then when you go out and it and it works. Um, you know, it's great. There's nothing better yeah. than seeing your session going really well. There's times when it's gone yeah. completely wrong and and it's. Yeah. Again, it's it's sometimes you know it's just holding your hand up and saying, "Yeah, oh, lads, that was rubbish." Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know you either you either look at it and you think, "Right, how can we adapt that to make mm. it work?" Or is it just a case of ripping up, punting the bin, and, and starting mm. from scratch? You know, because there's been one or two sessions where I've gone, "Oh my god, that was horrendous." Yeah. But like, I think it's been open enough to to ask whether it's Foxy or whether, mm. even if it's the player. So. Yeah. How did yeah. you find that? Or, yeah. um, and you're hoping that they give you an honest answer because yeah. I think you know we're not all perfect. We all make mistakes, yeah. and and I think it's when you do make mistakes, it's it's about learning from them and it's mm. trying to you know improve on that. And um, you know if we if we all done everything perfect, then you know yeah. it would be it'd be quite boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> I do, I was speaking to to Yogi, you know, a couple of months ago, and he said something that I thought was really kind of useful. Um, and he said, "I'm always when I'm doing a session, I'm doing something. I'm always trying to think of how will it land on my players, basically. You know, what mm-hmm. they'll think about it. Do you think it's useful for you, babe? Because it's not that long ago that you were playing. Do mm-hmm. you think that's useful for you still to have that kind of playing mentality as well when you're when you're coaching? Yeah, I, I think so because. <sighs> I think one of the big things for me is enjoyment as well. Like, you know, yeah. you know, like on the pro license when you're sitting and you're talking about yeah. like your different principles and your, and your ah. different, your styles of play and, yeah. and all that. One of the things for me that gets lost is, is enjoyability and, yeah. and, and, and the player, like the reason we all wanted to be footballers yeah. and, and, and do the, play the game yeah. is because we love the game and yeah. we love, we love the enjoyment that it gives us. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can get that can get lost, um, yeah. and I think you can you can probably you know focus you know too much on on trying to get everything perfect and everything ah. right, and then and then what happens then is it becomes very robotic, and, and yeah. the players then um, probably don't enjoy it. And I think that that for me is one of the biggest things that you know when you're when you're putting a session on, yeah. is it going to be enjoyable for the players? Yeah. Is it going to be enjoyable for the staff? Mm-hmm. Um, are they go- are they going to learn something from it? Yeah. Um, and am I going to get my message across that I want yeah. to get across yeah. in this session? And if you can get them three things in, I think yeah. um, you've won a watch. Yeah. How can you see yourself now, though? Can you see any coaching? Well, as you're coaching, I know it, it, it's kind of almost a, a question where you're looking at yourself. Do you think you've taken anything from any different coaches that is really obvious about your style? Or do you think you've developed your own style quite quickly? 
Um, that's a tough question. I think mm. you, you do try and you do. I I always kind of try and look at you know the people that I admire, the people yeah. that I like, and and then you look at how they do things. Mm. And I think you can take elements of it. I don't mm. think you can. I don't think you can be copy someone because mm. I don't think then that's you. I think you have to be authentic to yourself, um, and you have to try and find your own way. Um, mm. but there's there's there are elements and um you know aspects of of different the way people deliver sessions or the, or the way they they conduct themselves that you think I quite like that and mm. you would maybe then try and implement it in, into your own style in a certain way but as I said I don't think you can just go for instance like oh, I really like Jorgen Klopp I'm going to be try, trying to be like mm. Jorgen Klopp because I'm not Jorgen Klopp so yeah. I, can't, I can't be him so I think I think it is really important that yes you look at things that people do and, and mm. you try and take the bits that you like and and then it's looking at yourself and thinking mm. if I'm someone else look at me what would people take from me or what would they maybe say I don't like mm. this you know so and, and again mm. it's 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 speaking to people and um and and having that connection with people and whether it's like guys said, whether it's through the coaches at the club players and it's it's trying to get the feedback and being open to receiving yeah. feedback um and, and then being open then to to try and you know, change the things that don't work for you, and and um, and try and build on the 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 aspects that do work for you. I know we were speaking earlier, John, almost just to kind of finish with really about where you hope to go in, within your coaching. You know, and and I've seen you coaching and doing things over the last year and a half, and really impressed with your 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 as you say your prep preparation and how thoughtful you are around the game. Where do you see yourself, or where would you like to to head in your coaching journey? The next steps. Um, you know, again, I'm I'm quite open to mm. to where that is. You know, again, I spoke about we spoke about earlier. Mm. Scotland is is quite limited, and you know the number of teams and the number of roles that are available. So, you know. And, and I wanted to experience it as a player, but I, I would be very, very open to going abroad. Mm. Um, I went out to Philadelphia um, mm. in January when I first left Harris. Okay. I went out to Baltimore mm. to the soccer convention in America, mm. and then I went to Philadelphia to go do a club visit for as part of the pro license. So I think when I went out there, you can see how massive the mm. game is and, and how how vast it's gone out there. Mm. And, and the acceleration of the growth out there is, mm. is huge. Um, and I, I think, I know my wife and myself have been there numerous times on holiday. So I think at some stage of my career, I would love the opportunity to go out to America and, and coach and, and to yeah. see see where I could go. Um, yeah. But at, at the meantime, I'm, I'm kind of just focused on, on trying to get back in somewhere yeah. and whether that's on a coaching staff or as a, as a, a head coach. You know, I think yeah. ultimately I would like to be a head coach um, down the line. But mm. You know, I'm 37 years of age. I'm in no yeah. rush to get there. I think yeah. that's a, that's a long kind of career that I'm, I'm hoping to have. Um, but I think at the at the moment, I just want to try and go somewhere where I can learn and where I can improve myself. Superb, superb. And if if anyone wanted to contact you, just even to find out about your thoughts on coaching, is LinkedIn the best place to get hold of you? Or yeah, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, yeah. Just send me a message, yeah, and I, I'm very yeah. receptive to. As I said, you know, people wanting to do podcasts and, and stuff like that. I'm I'm great, and I love speaking to new people and, and networking yeah. with new people. And and just I do. I firmly believe that you can learn something off of everybody. You know, yeah. um, and I think you know, the more people you, you speak to, the the more information you then gather yeah. yourself that you can then use. Brilliant, John. So thanks for taking the time uh, this morning to speak to me, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Will do, Donald. Thanks very much for having me. Cheers, Cheers. Thank you.